have my attention? Can I have your attention? I guess that'd be more polite. Go ahead and call the meeting to order. This is the February 23rd planning, Portland Planning and Sustainability Commission meeting. On the, um, actually, before I get into the agenda tonight, I have some business to clean up. Um, that is, this is an item that's not on the agenda. Uh, the mo zoning map amendments for the zoning employment zoning project was continued over from October 27th to today. If there's anyone in the audience who was there, um, that was there, is there, is there anyone in the audience that was there to testify on this issue? Okay. Um, and um, I guess then the next question is if there's anybody who would like to testify in the audience, let me know. No? Okay. Um, the hearing for the zoning map amendments of the employment zoning project is further continued to May 24th, 2016. Um, that is the tentative hearing date for all of the comp plan zoning map amendments, and we encourage any interested parties to check with the commission's agendas and BPS's website for future hearing dates. So that's all we got on that little update. Any questions? Doesn't look like it. Okay, let's keep rolling. Um, what was that, Chris? Keeping the city attorney happy. <laughs> Trying. Um, okay, so on the agenda today, we have items of interest from the commissioners followed by the director's point. We have three items on the consent agenda due to the fact that I missed calling for approval of the consent agenda last meeting. Uh, we have task five residential and open space zoning map briefing followed by citywide parking strategy briefing and then we'll be adjourned. So starting off, are there any items of interest? Yes, Chris. So Gary and I attended the city council work session this morning. Uh, which is one of their comp plan work sessions. And we were asked by PBOT to participate to talk about changes to policy 9.6, which uh, many of you will remember is the, the transportation strategy or hierarchy policy that you know, we spent the better part of a meeting taking apart and putting back together again. Um, there were two issues we were asked to address. Um, one was how we incorporate ADA. Uh, and Gary may want to speak to that uh, since he was very involved in that, but PBOT basically recommended splitting that out into its own policy uh, to stand on its own rather than trying to blend everything together. Uh, and then Commissioner Fritz had questions about the possibility of flipping the order and putting transit before cycling. Um, and uh, I, I hope persuasively made the case that really we want to provide the public good that costs the least first and then get to the more expensive public good where we need to provide it. You know, her, her point fairly is that um, there are some people who can't bicycle, and obviously we need to provide a strong transit system, but uh, we do have very strong transit policies in the comp plan, so uh, we had a robust discussion about that. Anything to add, Gary? Um, yeah, I think it was generally a, a good conversation, and um, the, the, the Commissioner Fish really brought up an interesting concern about um, road rage and the intensity of driver to driver interactions really increasing in his experience and concern therefore very concerned about the crowding we're seeing on our roads and i think chris did a great job in really trying to make the point around bicycles are the biggest way that we can decompress the roads and lead people away from that strategy um, so I think uh, I think overall it was a nice it was a good discussion and we had done some work with with PBOT staff um, offline before the meeting and I think have some language now for council consideration that's really clear about uh, implementation of the um, ordered list so continue to make progress thanks for taking the time to do that gentlemen are there any other items of interest if not, Joe? Um, there's uh, two items in the director's report. Uh, first is just a reminder that Monday, uh, 1 to 5 in 7A on the seventh floor, we'll be having a Planning and Sustainability Commission retreat. And at these re this particular retreat, we're going to be looking back at um, you know uh, the last few years of work and uh, hearings and what's worked well, uh, and also looking forward into our um, um, end of the comp plan uh, adoption and then afterwards in terms of work program. Uh, so that's one to five on Monday. 
Um, secondly, uh, last week, uh, City Council voted unanimously to approve uh, the deconstruction policy. Uh, and in the resolution uh, that they adopted, it directs the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability to go and develop code now that requires projects uh, that are seeking a demolition permit for a house or a duplex to fully deconstruct the structure if it was built before 1916 or is a designated historic resource. So it's our first sort of step into this alternative form of uh, demolition for these structures that because of their age, uh, we know have, uh, are very likely to have valuable resources built into the buildings. Uh, and we'll bring back some code. Um, I'm not exactly sure when that deadline is to bring it back. Any question on that? I I saw in the press release one third of homes, 33% of homes have been deconstructed. I'm sorry. Um, I saw in the press release, I think, from PSC that one third of homes would be deconstructed under that, but that seemed way higher as a percentage than what we were. Does that ring true? You, you know, I don't know those numbers. I'll have to check them and we'll get them back out. You know, I'm, I'm just going to quickly add um, you guys. Everyone here should have received an email regarding the tree code as well. And so it looks like the city council hearing is scheduled for March 3rd, and there's been some kind of rethinking on that. So you might want to read your emails, and you're invited to attend if you'd like to. OK, next. Just a, a question on that. Um, I had on my schedule to go and give our presentation of what we presented at the, what we passed here at the for the tree code. Do you still want to do that with all the changes and everything? <laughs> How many options? <laughs> you know, Andrea, I'm I am. four now, I think. <laughs> um, I will, I have to once again check on this. I haven't been tracking it that closely to see um, what, if we're still sticking with that plan or not, so I can do that tomorrow. Okay. Get back to uh, Thank thanks. you, sorry about that. Okay, consent agenda. There are three items on the consent agenda, two um, minutes, um, January 23rd and February 9th, as well as the uh, right away vacation on Northwest 101st, south of Northwest Thompson Road. I move the consent agenda. Any discussion? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And aye. Uh, okay, next item is task five, residential and open space Zoning map. I believe Nan and Marty are going to present. Okay. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Nan Stark with the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. I am the Northeast District Liaison, and with me is Marty Stockton, who is the Southeast District Liaison with VPS. And uh, we are here to present the residential and open space zoning map update. We, as liaisons, represent our whole team of district liaisons, and we work with the community on We've been working with the community uh, for the last several months on this, um, this project. So um, as you know, uh, this is just one of several projects implementing the uh, 2035 comp plan. So we're doing updates to the employment zones and the campus institutional zones. Um, this is just one piece of that where we'll be talking about residential and open space zoning. And you'll also be hearing at a later date about the mixed use uh, zoning project. In our particular project, we don't have any updates to the um, zoning code. Each of these projects is being considered through its own public process and timeline. Um, and this briefing will provide information for the different components of the project so that you'll have a good background when the proposed draft is released, 
which is scheduled to come out next week. Um, it's, it's a culmination of community conversations, field work, and um, staff analysis following the release last November of the zoning map, um, uh, the discussion draft of the residential and open space um, zoning map update. So basically, um, there's three sets of proposals that we're uh, going to explain to you tonight. Um, they're grouped together by context, desired outcomes, and situations. So the first one uh, includes changes to the residential zoning maps and to the open space zoning maps. And those are situations where um, we are bringing the zoning map to correspond to what's been uh, put on the recommended draft comp plan map. The second thing I'll discuss is the David Douglas School District because it's got some um, uh, specific issues related uh, just to that school district. And then Marty will talk about the residential zoning <coughs> review areas. So the map that you're looking at is from the map app and it's showing only the, um, the residential and open space changes that were proposed in the November discussion draft. So the, these have been out for several months, the green areas representing open space changes to the map, um, yellow and blue representing uh, residential changes to the map. And then um, it's, it's kind of hard to see, but there's some black cross-hatched areas, and those are the residential zoning review areas that Marty's going to go into later. Are we going to have a closer look at those maps later? Yeah, we will. A okay. little bit. <laughs> and we can always go back if you need to. So um, as you recall in, in uh, updating the comp plan map, um, when we were looking at residential zones, uh, we were wanting to make some changes to certain parts of the city where um, there was a lack of connectivity or where public services were lacking, specifically um, talking about East Portland. Um, natural hazard areas, so those areas that have topographic challenges, drainage concerns, uh, most of those are in southwest Portland, also in um, outer southeast Portland, and then distance from centers and corridors and prevalent lot patterns. Um, those, those are kind of scattered around the city, in, uh, but, but mostly north, northeast, and southeast. And then, um, and then areas where we acknowledge the built environment, and that's um, really talking about where the built environment is built at a higher density than what the zoning um, is portraying. And then uh, in talking about the open space project, again, we um, updated the open space map on the comp plan last year. And um, we went through a process with public agencies. Uh, most of it, we really focused on uh, public land owned by the city, most of which was owned by Parks and Recreation and Environmental <coughs> Services, and also uh, land owned by Metro. Um, so we were able to identify um, areas of open space that were uh, either um, specifically on the map as future parkland area, or they were bond measure approved um, by Metro bond measures. Um, there were also situations where we were simply rectifying um, some errors where boundaries, for example, Forest Park um, had some areas of industrial zoning. And so, you know, ultimately the, the project is to have a really complete open space map that reflects what we have um, on the map. These are just three examples of uh, places that were not on the open space map before. On the left is Gateway Green uh, between the two freeways. Um, the upper right is Smith and Bybee Lakes, which a significant amount of that was zoned industrial. 
And the lower right is Thomas Cully Park that is um, under development. So, Mike, this is for you. Um, <laughs> does that help a little bit? <laughs> so, again, um, really the purpose of the project was to um, uh, get an accurate portrayal of what our open space system looks like. And um, this, again, is taken off the map app, so it's only showing the areas of change. So actually, I, I do have a question about it, and that is I'm just looking at what I think are the golf courses, and I'm just curious whether we, we went through a very lengthy process regarding industrial land and lands that would be zoned open space. Has that changed right. recently? Is, that, is the green I see on that map consistent with that conversation regarding uh, the EOA. And we're, we're not showing you the um, most recent map. So this is the one that came out of the map app. Uh, so the newest map um, hasn't been released yet, and, oh. and you will see that. Um, really, that part of the project uh, was done through Steve's project, the, the employment zoning project. And so um, the, uh, the open space changes in that project were removing some open space and converting that to industrial land. But for example, we do have um, coal wood on here. So, Joe, did you want to? Yeah, so add to that? <clears throat> go ahead, Mike. I think, I believe the way this is working is this is um, a, a more limited set of open space changes based on what Nan just described. They're open spaces that were that they are functionally and either in through ownership. That's what they should be, and we're correcting that. There's a whole other set of open space discussions we've had around the industrial lands and the golf courses, and that's a separate map package that comes through uh, that you all will see and vote on. Um, and then remember uh, the end of this whole sort of cycle is the composite map. So we take each of those different projects and the new zones that they um, put on the map, and you all are going to look at the whole map, and it's the, the right moment where if what you expected would be the result of those changes we made along the way isn't showing up, or if we're seeing things that when you look at the composite with all the new proposed uh, designations or issues, it's our moment to be able to uh, talk about that and fix it. Um, um, and then most practically, um, for a periodic review, the commission needs to forward a, a new zoning map all in one piece. So it'll be that moment as well when we pull the composite map together. So this is not the map of all open space changes that you all have looked at. Some have been in other projects. But I'm going to add one more thing, um, and that is where we had talked about applying industrial zoning, uh, just a comprehensive plan on the golf courses, we're still proposing to re retain the open space zoning. So that wouldn't show up as a change here because it's um, zoned, the, open, the golf courses are zoned open space today. They would continue to be zoned open space even if the comprehensive plan designation is for something else. Okay. Sorry, Did that answer this? <laughs> uh, um, can I just ask a question? And, and I, um, so I guess just what you said, Joe, is the left hand and the right hand knows what each is doing. Okay. I guess the short way of saying that. So, Steve and all these changes when they come to the end are going to be synced up. Perfect. And I guess I would just add that in terms of testimony, um, for this project, we don't really have any controversial, you know, areas of open space. Whereas in the employment zoning, that's or or in the comp plan zoning, that's where we got a lot of testimony about the golf courses. So, um, you know, so in the, when the proposed draft gets released, I wouldn't expect that you're going to hear a lot unless people just, you know, want to mention, want to bring up the golf courses, but they're not actually part of this. Okay. And then the David Douglas School District, we needed to focus on that um, 
basically because of school capacity constraints in the David Douglas School District. So a small number of properties that are zoned now, R1 or R2, within the district boundary are proposed for down zoning. Um, and we will be retaining the comp plan designation. So what you see in parentheses is the comp plan designation and um, the zoning is out of the parentheses. So right now we have properties that are zoned R2 that are in the R1. Well, we have R1 and R2 zoning with a designation of R1 and then we have R2 zoning that has the corresponding R2 designation. We're, we're changing 76 properties um, through this to down zone some of those to R5 and some to R2. Um, and those properties were selected based on these criteria. Not within a center, including gateway. Uh, currently vacant or developed only with a single dwelling structure identified in the buildable lands inventory as having capacity for three or more units. So by retaining the comp plan designation means that these properties will still have the opportunity to be developed at the higher density, but the property owner will have to come in and ask for a quasi-judicial zoning map amendment, um, or we can go through a legislative process uh, later on as the school starts to develop more capacity. The David Doug Douglas School District will have an opportunity during either of those properties to affirm that adequate capacity exists to accommodate new students generated by higher density development. So um, that's what you're seeing in the red are those areas of down zoning that we're proposing. Zoning, right. Yeah, exactly. So well, now I'm going to turn it over to question, Marty, Ellen? unless you have questions. Sure. Yeah, a question. <clears throat> I'm, I'm not seeing the logic. Why would David Douglas want those down? Are, they, are these properties that they're thinking of selling or just no, owning? These are yeah. these are privately owned properties, but, um, oh, but in their it's district. really just yeah, yeah. to address the school capacity issue. Got it, okay. So now Marty's going to tell you about the zoning review areas. Can I just say something? Um, just to clarify around that is that they their schools are at capacity, and so they're worried about with yeah. It sounds like it looks like you're nodding, Eli. Yeah, but I, mean, I got. I, I didn't. I thought these might be like some like school districts own like. Portland owns residentially prop uh -huh. property that they might want to sell. You know, yeah. I didn't know whether this was, no. I don't know if they, David Douglas has school holdings of this extent. It sounds like they don't. It's they just, actually own a quite a bit of property too, but um, that's a whole okay. other thing. Like, I think um, I understand it now, mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm gonna start with the briefing on the residential zone zoning review areas. And to be clear, we, titled uh, these the zoning review areas because for us as staff, um, these were areas that needed um, further analysis as well as um, further community outreach. And so um, we embarked on that particular effort again back in November 2015. So these areas, um, I have two more maps for you, Mike. Um, we have the map that gives you a little bit of the universe of where these areas occur. So it's the, the hatched areas on the map app layer, which is the, the map on the left-hand side. Um, this is a bit of a zoomed-in example, and so um, you know they are predominantly in inner southeast Portland as well as northeast Portland and north Portland. And specifically, these are areas that are where the comprehensive plan map designation from 1980 does not match the current zoning. Um, so hence, uh, a, a, an opportunity here within periodic review of the comprehensive plan to look at these areas. Um, also, I would say that these areas exist where there was not a community area planning effort during the last 35 years. Um, and these areas also make up about 3.5% of the land citywide. 
So if you look on the map on the right hand, um, lower right hand corner, that is an example of what you would see on a quarter section zoning map. And so um, you would see kind of the, the line work of the zone designations and then the dotted line and that shows you where there's a difference. And then you would also see the annotation of the R5 and then in, the, in parens you would see the R2.5. And so that's how you would see it on a, again, a quarter section zoning map. So getting back to where these areas are and, and, and what different um, kind of pairings they exist, again, they are predominantly in north, northeast, and inner southeast Portland. The largest combination is the first one where it's the R5 zone with the R2.5 comp plan map designation. And then you can see that there's some other combinations, R5 with the comp, uh, comp plan map designation of R2 or R1. And then in inner southeast Portland, we do have a bit of R2 that has a comp plan map designation of R1. I would note, and, and for those of you that have been on the Planning Commission for a few years, that um, we do have these areas that exist adjacent to um, MAX stations. And so the 60th Avenue MAX station was something that was before you in 2011. And that is, uh, again, an area that we are reviewing as a part of this process. Uh, so that involves the Rose City Park and the North Tabor Neighborhood Associations there at 60th Avenue. Um, additionally, we have um, two other areas that are along the new orange line in the Hosford Abernathy neighborhood. Those are specifically areas that are within the quarter mile radius of the Clinton and 12th MAC station, as well as the 17th and Rhine MAC station. So embarking upon kind of our analysis as well as the public involvement, um, these were essentially the three different outcomes that could occur um, based on, again, the analysis or the, the public involvement. So um, we could recommend changing the zoning to match the comprehensive plan map designation. Uh, we also could change the zoning to match the comp plan map only on properties with non-conforming residential development, which there is quite a bit of, or on smaller lot sizes. Um, additionally, we could retain the status quo so we could keep the split, the difference. And then in some cases um, where there was natural hazards, um, we could also um, re-look at the comp plan map designation, determine if that was appropriate, and potentially down-designate to match the zoning map. I only have one example, and that is an example in the Ardenwald Johnson Creek area. This was an area that did not meet the threshold for Roberta Jortner or Mindy Brooks analysis when they came before you um, last year because the acreage was too small. But I was pretty, pretty excited to catch it. Um, and this is an area that includes um, a 100-year and 500-year floodplain, um, environmental zoning, steep slopes, and properties that um, have gone through um, recent land divisions and lot confirmations, but have not been able to be developed upon. So in, in that particular example of Ardenwald Johnson Creek, Creek area, we are proposing to go from a comp plan map designation of R2.5 to the current zoning, which is actually a mix of R5 and R10. Um, and I, I'm pretty excited about that one. OK, to touch upon some of the uh, analysis, um, you know, we did look at um, infrastructure capacity. And so again, you know, what was the capacity of the, um, the sewer, stormwater, um, uh, and transportation systems in the area? Uh, we looked at steep slopes. Um, so the, the two um, maps are actually of the same area. That actually is an area that is in the, the Mount Tabor neighborhood. And you can actually see the slope line of our beautiful butte there. Um, and it's, again, just north of Mount Tabor. <clears throat> 
Uh, we also, again, included floodplain. Um, existing conditions refer to um, what is built on the ground as well. So, you know, are there non-conforming residential um, development present as well as your smaller lot sizes? Market activity, you know, uh, what are the demolitions, the redevelopment that's occurred in the area, as well as has there been, um, you know, over the past um, 35 years, have there been um, quasi-judicial zone changes that have occurred in this area? Um, there are some areas, um, uh, Sunnyside comes to mind, where it, you have almost a Swiss cheese effect of where there's been so many zone changes that have occurred throughout the years. Um, and then again, proximity to centers. So in this case of um, Mount Tabor, your proximity to Montevilla Neighborhood Center to the um, east and to the, the new 60th Avenue um, Neighborhood Center to the west. And again, land use and available transit in the area. Yeah, I'm curious. I know there's a, uh, and I don't, I'd like to know the status, I guess, that there's a, there was a lawsuit on FEMA regarding floodplain designations, and I know there was a lot of question about what impact that would have on processes like this. Is that, has that been resolved and factored into the work that's going on now, or is that still out there? Because things could change pretty dramatically, is my understanding. Yeah, the, uh, the lawsuit is still out there. It's based on a model that um, uh, was a, a lawsuit that took place in the state of Washington, so we sort of know what the implications may look like. Um, and um, it's still, the rulemaking or the findings of it are still being um, developed. Uh, there may be some interest and pressure in getting this done before an administration change, so um, we don't really have a concrete uh, deadline on when it comes out, but the kind of thing it could do is uh, significantly redefine how we need to look at the floodplains or certain parts of the floodplain. Uh, so, but um, we really just don't know what to expect till we see it. So those Presumably, those sorts of adjustments would be made at a later time, then, yeah. apparently. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I've got kind of a newbie question. So, the comp plan you're showing on here, is that the current comp plan? Okay. So, we go through this process again based on the updated comp plan that's going through to figure out what things to bring zoning up to the future comp plan? Right? In terms of the... So what's shown on the, the lower map is actually the recommended draft of the comprehensive plan. That's what okay. is shown in color. In the line work and in the annotations of the text, that is actually the existing comprehensive plan map and zoning map. And I apologize, it's a little bit convoluted, but that is frankly how I read a map, is looking at both maps layered together. That's the easiest story the for me. and the proposed one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So if there's some portions of the proposed zoning code map that aren't figured out yet, you don't really have the information to figure out what zoning might go up to it or not, because you don't know where you're going up to. Is that So okay? last year we went through the, the comprehensive plan map process. Right. And um, as Nan mentioned earlier, our assumption is that we are bringing the zoning up to match those recommended um, comprehensive plan map designations that occurred last year. So we're just we're just assuming a match, with the exception of David Douglas, because of infrastructure and school capacity. There's some. So between there. the time the Sustainability Commission recommended approval of a new recommended comp plan map, now City Council they go and play around with things and move around, then you've got a shifting terrain you're trying to work towards. Is that right? Okay. Mm -hmm. That's correct. One thing really quickly that I forgot to mention, and then we can go to some questions, is that I was kind of reading down through the list, but occupancy is a really important one to point out. So occupancy is the, really the people factor uh, as far as data is concerned, and so we do look at what percentage of homeowners versus um, people that rent in a particular area. And why is that important for us? You know, we do look at, you know, what is the potential um, outcome on a vulnerable population? And if, if there is a map change, you know, would there um, be a more likelihood of redevelopment in the area? And for us, when we had an area um, like in Mount Tabor, for example, that has, you know, a, um, close to an 80% um, home ownership, um, percentage. This is an area that is um, 
relatively stable in that, um, you know, it will be the owners that would be, you know, making that decision whether or not to redevelop or, or to sell the property. Okay. Yeah, I have a question. I, you know, I've had my mind on IZ all day because it's mm -hmm. not going so well. Um, and, you know, I'm thinking also back to one of the work sessions we had on housing and one of the commissioners talked about, you know, um, on any number of these zoning changes, like what are we getting in return? Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, say we have a residential um, zone, base zone, um, and, um, you know, it's not matching the use, um, and say we want to make the comp plan uh, commercial or mixed use. So I'm trying to get, because we're trying to match it, mm -hmm. right? So in that change, um, is there any way to include an incentive like you're going to have in affordable housing if you're changing from lower density or residential use to a commercial mixed use, et cetera, when we do that change? Say it goes through, you know, you, you keep the base zone, and as opposed to upzoning, mm -hmm. um, they'd have to go through a process, you know, to get that up designation or up zone. And then in the process, you would require a public use, affordable housing, et cetera. So if I could take that one, um, there, um, um, there's a whole, there's several different tracks right now about that kind of uh, um, getting, um, extracting value out of a real estate transaction. And uh, the one that came up most recently at the work session was about what the city council was calling value capture from uh, upzonings. Um, and so the notion would be that um, uh, there's some value, the value, part of the value that's created by uh, allowing or um, upzoning a, a property um, is legitimately recaptured by the locality to spend on a public benefit like affordable housing. There's a model of this uh, that they're using in Ashland, so we uh, were asked to take a look at how that might apply uh, in Portland. And uh, the trade-offs are, um, as you might imagine, um, between generating potentially some resources for affordable housing or some benefit, but also potentially not seeing the increased housing production, not seeing the change in the, 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 the density. Um, you know, you have to set the price uh, accurately uh, to be able to not create such a disincentive the change doesn't happen. And so the change is always in the interest typically of producing more housing units. Um, and then we're also, uh, so that's, that's the, uh, um, an idea that's, that's on the table. So these zoning changes that we're talking about here from going up to, uh, to R25, from R5, correct? So just to give or, you an example. Not that big. Yeah, so most of these lots are um, right around 5,000 square feet. That's kind of a typical lot in, in Portland. And if you're going from R5, your minimum and maximum density is one, to R2.5, your minimum density is one, your maximum density is two. So it's a, it is a question, a little bit of, excuse me, proportionality um, on a, a request like that. But if there were a situation where you're going from single family zone up to uh, a higher density multifamily zone, then you know the, the math could work differently. Um, and then you just would have to consider, uh, you know, the other factors involved. And I think we might have uh, some of those coming to you when we do the zoning map. Um, but the trade-off really is getting some value or getting some resources out of it for affordable housing versus putting the, the unintended consequence would be suppressing housing production and you know and that you put the two together and that's part of what our affordability problem is is there's a, a, a lack of housing period being developed 
um, there's a lack of affordable housing, program housing being developed. And both of those contribute to the housing uh, crunch that we're experiencing now. So um, I don't, when you look at that problem, this is going to come back to us. You said at some point we're going to mm -hmm. vote on it. So the intersection of that decision and the intersection of what you talked about when we talk about whether or not we make, we apply the some kind of bonus or extracting value and mm -hmm. whether or not that's a good decision or not, are those aligned so that they're made about the same time or? You know, there um, it's just like someone observed about the, uh, Eli observed about the comp plan. You know, uh, there's policy in the current comp plan, mm -hmm. which is in front of city council now, that would allow us to consider things like this. Um, their level of interest may be that they put more explicit policy or sort of direction in there, and that's you know another um, motivation to bring it forward as a code change when we bring the code packages through. Um, so it's either a code a change that would be part of a package we'd bring through you all, uh, bring through here as part of task five, okay. or it's something that comes later. Or, because here's the other confounding sort of element about it. As a policy option that's clearly in the comprehensive plan, we can go back at it uh, and, and at a future time uh, to institute uh, that kind of provision. Um, the 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 geography now of housing uh, the housing development costs and and housing development fees is changing with the possibility of inclusionary zoning or construction excise tax coming out of the state this legislature although it it goes back and forth every, every hour <laughs> uh, the possibility of a linkage fee um, mm -hmm. citywide on commercial development possibly on residential development the possibility of, of uh, affordable housing related bonuses uh, and uh, the possibility of a value capture up zoning kind of provision. All of those add up. And so at the end, we'd want to take a look at what the total sort of extra expenses that we've loaded onto, uh, develop, onto residential development projects uh, to see it, you know, if it's still workable and if there is a more direct, easy to administer, easy to get your head around if you're a developer way of doing it. So there's, there's a whole bunch of choices that are laying out there in front of us right now. The policy to try to do something like getting, uh, doing some, uh, a, it's a different kind of linkage, but getting a value out of a significant up zone is in the, uh, the comprehensive plan. The legalities of it are, uh, um, at least we know of one version of it that's been held up in Ashland, but it's not some, it, there's a lot of legal hurdles in Oregon state law as well. My, my concern was just, it seems like this is moving at the comp plan mm -hmm. speed. The, in, in what you described, Joe, is probably moving a little slower to come forward about the actual value capture decisions and that. And, and my concern would be, even though it's not a lot amount, about 3% is what you said of the housing stock, it's still, it's still an opportunity. And do we, how do we address that opportunity? Because once we make a decision, it's kind of a done deal and the opportunity has gone. Um, the, um, I believe that what we'll have to do is um, evaluate the, um, value capture kind of ideas that the city council is interested in seeing, uh, you know, develop those enough so that you all can look at them as, as well, uh, because you will need to look at them in advance of whatever got sent to city council. And it's not saying that even what we came up with would, you know, make it out of the commission here or make it through city council. But that's, I think, probably the order will have to do this. Uh, and. Um, when we do that, we're going to just need to talk through the intended and unintended consequences of doing something that the workability and, and a variety of other issues. Um, my gut is for a change from R5 to R2.5, it is not going to look like a good idea. But let's look at the idea before we judge it. Okay. 
and one thought would be that this commission could, if we're basically handing out a whole bunch of free up zones, um, that might be good timing to recommend that the city adopt a, a linkage fee so that when someone utilizes that up zone, they're paying towards <clears throat> some affordable housing. And it, I don't know if that would come through this commission, but um, we could certainly recommend that. And politically, that might be good timing to, um, to, to adopt some kind of fee like that. Yeah, and I guess just one more thing. I feel like doesn't it save almost half the process if you're up designated versus up zoning? Is there so if, for the developer for um, an application for a comprehensive plan map amendment with a zone map amendment? You're looking at thirty-two thousand dollars, and that's just city fees, and so that wouldn't include hiring a consultant or, or, or doing a traffic study. For a zone change to match a, comp a higher comprehensive plan map designation, you're looking at $18,000. So if, you know, again, on the R5 to R2.5 on a 5,000 square foot lot, if the ultimate gain is one additional unit, you know, that's, that is why we haven't had many um, up zones to R2.5 in the last 35 years. That's why so many of these areas exist in inner Southeast Portland. Okay. So again, um, mirroring the, or kind of matching the um, analysis that staff did, uh, we also um, wanted to connect with the neighborhoods that were, um, that have these uh, zoning review areas. Um, so between November and December of last year, we did hold uh, 14 neighborhood meetings. Um, each of these meetings did have, you know, they were um, customized for that neighborhood. So we went in and we talked specifically about the Richmond community or about um, the Overlook community. Um, you know, in attendance, as you can imagine, at neighborhood association meetings, it completely varies. And so we would have, we had anywhere from five to over 60 people attend uh, a, at any given meeting. Um, altogether, there were um, about 185 people that uh, attended these um, neighborhood meetings. Uh, additionally, we had the residential open space map app layer available for public comment through the end of last year. Um, and then the public comments uh, we received, uh, we did have the 14 neighborhood meeting summaries, and so people attending those meetings, their comments were recorded in summaries. Uh, we had 19 comments that were generated by the MAP app, and then we had 15 comments that came directly via email. Um, I would note that public involvement you know, on the comprehensive plan um, began back in 2012 with the beginning of, 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 of the comp plan update. Um, this has been a conversation that has, um, that has kind of occurred very gently throughout um, that time since 2012. Um, before the Planning and Sustainability Commission last year when uh, people were testifying specifically on the comprehensive plan map, there actually was quite a few um, items of testimony that was only on the zoning map. So people, you know, there are people out there that are aware of this um, mismatch. And so, um, you know, that testimony was great, but it, it wasn't quite um, timely for what was before you at that time. So as far as uh, the content of what we heard in the public comment, um, we did hear, uh, you know, as you can imagine, a mix of support and opposition um, from, uh, you know, the, um, you know, we had the meeting summaries, but kind of the specific test, uh, public comment we did receive from 34 individuals, groups, and neighborhood associations. Um, we did receive support from Ardenwald Johnson Creek because, uh, you know, in, in that situation, uh, we are proposing actually a down designation to match the zoning and kind of a environmentally sensitive area. For North Tabor Neighborhood Association, again, that's the neighborhood that is on the south side of 84, I-84 I adjacent to the 60th Avenue Max Station. They're very much in support of um, higher intensity next to a Max Station that's been there since 1986. Um, 
Additionally, we um, have been coordinating with our um, with our uh, sister and brother bureaus here at the city. So we've been coordinating with Bureau of Environmental Services and the Portland Bureau of Transportation, as well as the Bureau of Development Services. But it's BES and PBOT that have given us some feedback that have helped refine the proposal. I would note that um, we are going to be embarking on kind of a new stage of this particular project once the public notice is mailed on March 7th. Um, specifically within the residential um, zoning review areas, we will be sending public notice out to 2,718 um, specific properties. Take another shot at the floodplain question. There's <laughs> there's the legal issue with FEMA and what might come out, out of that. And I was pleased to see that uh, BES is providing input. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess my question is, we're pretty darn clear that there are going to be increases in floodplain extent based on uh, climate change. And so was any of that kind of analysis brought into this conversation in terms of, say, Johnson Creek, for example, mm -hmm. what, what it's likely to look like out there in 10, 15, 20 years. With the floodplain, we specifically used um, the 100-year and the 500-year floodplain. And there was only a very, very small um, area in the Ardenwald Johnson Creek that um, had, again, this difference or mismatch between the comprehensive plan and the zoning map. So. Um, so, you know, that was where I was, I'm able to propose a change. With that said, um, we can't disregard all the work that Roberta Jortner and Mindy Brooks did last year on the comprehensive plan map, right. considering these sensitive areas as well. But to get at your specific question as far as um, FEMA's maps and the expansion of the floodplain area, that's not something that I um, took into my analysis. I have a question. Would city council is voting on the updated map in April, right? And there's like dozens of pages of potential changes there. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering whether it might make sense to do that public contact right after the maps set, or maybe you guys thought this through. Like, I don't know how many things on that list of city council changes would <laughs> affect areas where you might have to make a decision again on whether to bring zoning up the comp plan. So I'm just thinking about timing, having to do stuff twice. Mm -hmm. We sort of have to do it twice uh, <clears throat> to be able to keep moving forward. So um, because of the notice requirements, um, if they change it, we'll do another round of notices for th where those changes are. But that, but as uh, it is actually is the most expeditious. And what there the the number of changes that um, we're seeing, just like the experience was in the PSC, is is getting smaller and smaller. So. It's been through a large hearing process mm -hmm. already, so it's honed down pretty tightly. So, um, um, I would say that receiving multiple notices from the city is not necessarily a bad thing. And we also have the comprehensive plan helpline staff that can answer phone calls to help navigate people through the process, uh, besides the district liaison team. So. So I do want to connect all this work to um, comp plan policy. Um, so the, these are specifically policies that, that are in the draft, um, recommended draft uh, before council. So we do have policies that are um, uh, in support of this work from the um, chapter three, which is the chapter on urban form, as well as chapter four, which is the chapter on design and development and of course, chapter five. These are some kind of higher level policies that um, you know, are, are in support of um, having zoning that matches the comp plan and opportunity rich areas. Um, with that said, this is uh, a little bit of the tip of the iceberg that there are many other policies that would support this um, proposal. So as far as the next steps in the project, um, the proposed draft of the residential and open space zoning map will be released publicly in early March. On March 7th, the public notice will be mailed to affected property owners. And then we will be back before you on April 12th uh, you know, for the public hearing. 
Um, so we can give, a, Nan and I, or perhaps others on the district liaison team can give an update on um, just a, a summary of um, the testimony at that point that we've gotten via email and written testimony, and then we can go into the public hearing. And then as Joe mentioned, uh, there will be a, a composite um, public hearing on, on the composite uh, zoning map uh, tentatively scheduled in, on May 24th. So at this time, you know, if there are additional questions that we haven't answered throughout the presentation, we'd like to open it up for discussion. No questions? We did it all throughout. So yeah. thank you, Nan and Marty. We re really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Next up is the citywide parking strategy. I'll go ahead and get started. My name is Judith Gray, and I am a supervising planner with the Portland Bureau of Transportation. I want to thank you for the time tonight on your agenda to talk to you. This is actually my first time in front of this group. I've been with the city for just about a year and a half, which let me begin here as we were really kicking off, or, or just in the state of kicking off a lot of parking efforts you might have heard about. Um, <clears throat> Grant Moorhead and Mauricio Leclerc are with me, and they're really the experts on the topics for tonight, but I wanted to just say a few introductory words just to sort of set the stage a little bit. So first I have to begin with credit to the New Yorker magazine for summing up my life when it comes to parking. Um, you know, we're doing a lot of different topics on parking and I know from experience that when people say we're gonna talk about parking, any of you may have a different thing in mind about what that topic might be. If we were to hone in on a specific topic, we certainly might have different opinions about the right and wrong answer. So we wanted to start with a little bit of discipline for ourselves about what would be the most useful and constructive for the time we have tonight. Um, I will say that one thing that this cartoon mirrors in my experience is that topics of the topic of parking is always very lively. <clears throat> Like I mentioned, we're working on several things that you probably have heard of, many of them anyway. And in the, is the sound okay? Is it, is it low? Is that better? It is better. Okay, it sounds a little weird to me. Yeah, it's like Yeah, it doesn't sound very clear. I can't tell what it's like for you, but. Um, well, in the packet that Mauricio just handed out, there is a summary table that kind of outlines some more of the activities we've been doing, so that's here for your reference. But what we'll focus on our presentation tonight, Mauricio will talk about, first of all, some history of parking in the city of Portland, but also a major update that we've nearly completed now for the central city uh, parking code and how we regulate and, re and uh, what we require from private development. And that's something that's being done as part of the Central City 2035, so you'll be seeing that again. In addition to that work, um, we'll present to you a pr our proposal for really changing the approach that we have for managing public parking. And I would say bringing it into the 21st century, in fact. It's, the phrase is often called uh, performance-based parking management, and it's typically applied for meter districts. But when, when I say typically, I mean in the industry. Other cities typically would the city of Seattle and San Francisco and Boston might have a performance-based parking management program that they apply to their meter districts, how they set the pricing. But we really are hoping that we can take the concept, the principle of it, and apply it citywide. So you'll hear a little bit about that tonight as well. And then Grant Moorhead will 
talk about the um, outcomes of the Centers and Corridors Toolkit and Parking Analysis project he's been doing. That is something that while it happens at an operational level, so it isn't officially going to be coming to this group for a, 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 an official recommendation, it does respond to a lot of issues I think you hear about. It responds to increasing pressures from growth in mixed use areas and commercial development and the pressures that are being experienced in the residential neighborhoods. And it responds specifically to direction that you provided, I think, in 2013. And I am really having trouble hearing you. I mean, it's like you're, um, it's like. How's this? Is this better farther away? Testing, one, two, three? I think so. OK. Well, if you miss any part of tonight's presentation, it's best if you miss mine and hear theirs, because they will get into more substance. So do make sure that you let us know if you're actually missing that substance part. Oh. Um. I was just wondering if your mic was going to be better. I know. Can you hear me OK? Is that better? Yeah. Okay. OK. So I'll just be careful here and uh, go through pretty quickly. Yeah. You're less this likely one. to have feedback if you just have one off. Yeah, I turned the other one off. But uh, is this a little bit better? I'll be done pretty quickly here. And then we can turn it over to Mauricio. Um, this is an image that we frequently actually, I think this gets called the bacon and eggs map of Portland. It's, it's really just kind of to set an organi organizing framework for the citywide strategy, which we've focused in on the central city and then also another effort on the centers and corridors. There is some geographic overlap. There's also some overlap in principle. You'll see this uh, figure again as Mauricio and Grant go through their presentations. And this is my last slide, and then uh, I'll be able to turn it over. But this kind of shows a, the, the timeline of the major milestones. Those squares show, and the lines show, the processes for the Centers and Corridors Project, the Central City Project, and it, at the same time, we also did a downtown meter rate adjustment over the course of last summer. The timeline actually started, the, the committee started meeting in December of 2014. Um, this graphic starts in April, that's just when we had created it. Over the course of this time, both of these uh, stakeholder advisory committees met about 10 times each. We think we spent about 1,000 collective hours with them. We ate about 1,000 pizzas with them. Um, we also had a parking symposium in June, which was an all day long event with really great attendance, and over 40 different outreach meetings to community groups and um, business groups. We think that we, we actually have counts that we touched about 900 different people had an opportunity to hear from us and to weigh in on this with us. So I think that the work that you're going to hear tonight is really the, the recommendations of the two advisory committees with a lot of public input. Um, so with that, I thank you for your time and for your patience on the audio. I turn it over to Mauricio. Can you hear me? All right. Okay. Mauricio Leclerc? Yeah. Um, <laughs> So uh, we'll do two things, uh, hist a brief history of parking. You know, we, we have a long history in Portland of understanding the impacts of parking on urban form. And I think we learned the lesson a lot earlier than other cities. And um, so that's important for us because it sets the context of where we're going. We are not changing pace. We're not changing path, I guess, or direction. Rather, we wanna, we're fine tuning our recommendations as you said to the 21st century and to the needs, the new challenges that have evolved uh, as we grow uh, as a city. So uh, last thing I'll say that the recommendations that you'll hear from the Central City uh, and uh, the Centers and Coiler were very well received by the public uh, to date and uh, they were adopted by consensus uh, by the committees that uh, we formed. This is a picture of Lloyd District in the 60s. Lloyd, uh, one of the models for the nation, the, the new mall. It was direct competition from across the river in downtown. It, uh, it, you can see a little bit of the housing on the lower right, but the new model was built as much parking as you can, and that's the way that you'll get great economic development, great urban form. You know, that's the future. Uh, highways, and uh, uh, you don't have to hit, if you can, can avoid hitting pavement, that's great. <laughs> uh, of course, you end up walking a lot on parking lots, but uh, you know, th they never told you that story. So, uh, but the, the history actually starts way earlier for uh, how we managed parking. In 1937, uh, a person in, um, in the Midwest invented the parking meter. 
It was an instant success. In the, a year later, Portland and other cities were all over this. Be, why? Because we had a new problem. Uh, Model T and other um, cars became cheap. Suddenly, everybody had them. And all the, all the employees were parking on the curb. Uh, and the retailers were saying, hey, wait a minute, you know, that's not right. You know, what about the retailers? So new policies were put in place to actually encourage that that space, the curb zone that we're calling now, be dedicated for retail. Uh, and since then, we, that's the policy that we have today, and that's the policy that we carry forward, except that we didn't have a way to monitor and to enforce it. They were, I went back to get these pictures, uh, articles in the, in the Oregonian that would pr probably policemen, a lot of uh, police uh, time was used in trying to enforce this. When this person came with this uh, uh, idea, paying for parking, it generated a lot of angst, but a year later after it was implemented in the first city, I think it was Columbus or Cleveland, Ohio, all over the place and the country they were introducing this with some angst, but then pretty much it was the 10 blocks, around, uh, basically 1,300 spaces around the old downtown core now, a total success, and ever since we have expanded it. And so that's, so we basically have the policy that we had in place, you pay with the coin and the meter since the 30s, and actually that's the policy we have today. We haven't quite, uh, the technology has changed, but we, our policy hasn't quite, so we'll show you how we're gonna uh, change that. The other key factor in this is the picture on the right, that as we expanded the meter area, what happened was, what happened to those commuters that were trying to kick off the curb? They began to park right outside the meter area, right? And then you walk into your work. So we began, another tool that got developed was the permit um, program. That's the first one, Gander Ridge, just south of, uh, south of PSU on the other side of the freeway. That's zone B today. So that's another tool that we have now, but it was addressed for commuters, people who were not coming to Gander Ridge that actually were coming, going to downtown and parking in, in, in Gander Ridge. So uh, that's the policy and that's the meter policy that we have today. In reality, as you know, probably better than anybody, we have different problems today. We have there are not com people come, commuters coming to an area and moving on. Actually, people coming to restaurants in the area, people coming to work, and, and that's the new challenge that we have, particularly outside of the central city, along Hawthorne Division in Hollywood Town Centers. And we have so basically, we have a new permit program to address that issue. And, and Grant will talk about that. So moving forward. Uh, we gave all the space we could to the car because otherwise, you know, uh, we, were, we needed to compete with the suburbs. We ended up that in the 1970s, uh, downtown and the, the city of Portland had severe, clear uh, air quality violations. In the 70s, we had a, out, of, out of compliance with the new clear, Clean Air Act one out of three days, and something needed to be done. Basically, it was choking, literally, the uh, development of, this, of the central city. The government, federal government was saying you need to do something, otherwise we won't be able to uh, allow you to grow anymore. So in, in 1975, uh, working with the Department of Environmental Quality, we developed a plan, a down, downtown parking and circulation policy that created a, a parking cap, about 40,000 stalls, uh, limit no new surface parking lots, and you know, expanding on the transit service and so forth. And it, it, you know, this is the time of the 1972 plan, so there was a whole new mentality for how to do planning in downtown areas. You know, and, and that tradition continues today. But that was the beginning. We needed to respond to air quality. So basically, we were Killing, um, killing downtown in order to save it, taking down old buildings and actually end up with a lot of pollution. That was not a winning strategy. So we changed course in the 70s. And that's where we are today. So basically the new rule, you know, once we began to analyze the planners at the time, they realized that to accommodate the growth that we needed to revitalize the central city, we needed about six uh, US bank towers just to park in stalls. And that was not a winning solution for anybody nor was it affordable, nor was it good, since we have always had limited capacity on our uh, streets. So we needed to limit the growth of parking. So that's what we did in the 70s, and that was reaffirmed in 1995 with, in the central city with the CCTMP, Central City Transportation Management Plan, which actually lifted that uh, cap, but imposed new, uh, a new way of uh, managing parking by punching this, pinching the supply, I'm sorry, meaning allow parking to grow above the cap but not grow so much. Let development, you know, the people coming in and living and working in downtown 
grow at a faster rate than your parking supply. And that's what we've done since, since at the same time that we're invested in transit, walking, and now increasingly in bicycle. And uh, the strategy has worked, not just because of the investment in transit and other modes, but also because of the uh, cleaner vehicle technology and fuel. So we, have, we haven't had a carbon monoxide violation since, since 1987. Uh, but new challenges have come up. So. Um, Let's see. So we've uh, we started the citywide parking strategy with, uh, as Judith said, with uh, three committees largely. We had Chris Smith in two of them, <laughs> so we appreciate their help. And uh, uh, we had a TSP transportation expert group look at our policies from a TSP comprehensive plan level to make sure that we were coming up with was in alignment in sync what the with the com com, com plan uh, policies that we all came up uh, together collectively uh, over this last few years. So. Uh, the packet that we gave you has some uh, a brief a summary of all the things that are going on related to parking. This is just a summary up here. It's quite complex, and uh, we apologize for that, but basically what we're doing is uh, using the comprehensive plan policies that we developed to guide planning processes that are currently underway. You know, that's the middle road, Central City 2035, mixed use zoning, you know, campus institution, North West Parking. They will be coming to you or to plan uh, City Council at some point. I will be talking about two of them today. But uh, note that you know not only do we have a lot of projects touching a lot of the geography, but also we have a level of complexity from comp plan, highest policy, all the way to uh, zoning, Title 33, and also other elements of uh, the city code, Title 16, vehicles and traffic, and Title 17, public, public improvements that touch on other elements, non-zoning elements, of transportation policy, and some of them get even to the lower level administrative rules. So we won't get to this level today, but so you understand the complexity of it, you know, and uh, hopefully it helps you navigate as we move forward with these projects and bring them to uh, implementation. So these are the ones for today, and we'll give you a, a, a quick summary. So where we are today, uh, we, you know, now we're just bringing you to today. That's pretty much on the history, but uh, talking to, you know, the thousand people and having conversations and developing policies on the comp plan, you know, there are about three things that we're particularly focusing on. One is to better use the parking that we have, the existing parking, uh, if Smart Park is an example here, but also private lots, you know, uh, they end up being used for the peak or for whatever purpose and then empty for much of the time. And then the next tower comes and they build their parking and in reality that's an, an underutilization of a very valuable expensive asset. So we wanted to be able to better simplify regulations to allow more what we're calling sharing of parking so that, you know, we better, we get a better, uh, more efficient system, but also make sure that uh, we don't have to build so much new parking since there's already parking available for people. Uh, and, uh, the second idea is to move to a more demand responsive management of the on street parking system. It's challenging today to adjust the parking rates. It's done via council action and initiate parking plans. You know, it takes years and years of collected effort to get what going. But uh, in reality, we can do better. You know, we, we have a toolbox that will help us get there and also a new approach. Technology, you know, you can see now uh, the smart park, the smart meters that we have now compared to the coin one operated in the third in the 30s. These things can do a lot more. They can be, uh, you know, they carry information. They can charge different rates and so forth. And we want to be able to use that to better manage uh, parking over uh, in the future. So we're calling that new approach performance-based parking management. And we'll show you a few slides in a little bit what other cities are doing uh, on this topic. And the third thing, and Grant will lead that later on, would be to um, address the issue that we talked about earlier, that the parking spill over into single family neighborhoods. You know, people come to the main street, new development, had new restaurants. And how, how do we address that, that conflict that is developed over the years and that you addressed in 2013 uh, via the parking, new parking regulations for uh, off-street development? So uh, with that, I'll move on to uh, provide you a deeper level on the central city. Uh, is that okay? All right, let me take a little bit of water. So we work with a committee, about 30 members, uh, all throughout last year. Uh, and the things that we're touching on, you know, uh, will be primarily zoning code that will come to you as part of the Central City Plan. You know, that's on the lower right. Uh, in uh, Starting late May, we'll be having uh, he uh, briefings here and hearing. Um, but also, as the performance-based parking management 
uh, will take to council this spring to to start the program, and those will you know those policies if we were to implement them will live in Title 16 and Title 17 in admin, admin rules you know, so uh, we formed a committee and we decided what to do. You know, we were very closely working with BPS and make sure that the parking policies that we develop are in sync with the direction of the Central City 2035 plan. So we want to. As foundational principles, before we got to work, we develop, make sure that we wanted to encourage the development of the central city, support the most goals uh, for the central city plan, continue to limit the growth of parking as we've done in the past. It's been a good recipe for us. Introduce, but at the same time, introduce greater flexibility uh, for how parking is used in existing parking and also future parking, and uh, simplify existing regulations, which are about a hundred pages long, and, uh, and only a few people in the world can understand. <laughs> Here's one next to me. Uh, so um, uh, the growth of this, uh, so basically uh, we are expecting a part of the central city to grow by about 50,000 jobs and 37,000 households. The trick is how to do that you know, without uh, affecting livability, make sure that our, our transportation system can handle this growth. And the way to do it is certainly to, to have a smart parking management that uh, uh, is in sync with these policies and has also uh, supports in investments in uh, uh, multimodal network and infrastructure, I'm sorry. So uh, here's the, the summary slide, and I'll get, I will get into a little bit more detail. Uh, but basically what we did was simplify a process called C C Central City Parking Review. Many of these, you come in for development, sometimes, you know, oop, you got to go through this new track, more expensive, you know, more onerous. You know. We're simplifying only a few cases now. We'll go through CCPR, what we're calling. Uh, reduce the parking sectors from 26 to 6. I'll show a picture in a little bit. Adjust the parking ratios. You know, every building can build as, up to an amount, no more. You know, we adjusted those, we calibrated them. Uh, we, yeah, we're limiting, we're providing new limitations for new surface parking lots, and we're simplifying the preservation parking regulations. Well, I'll give you an example. And we're removing barriers to share parking, to uh, how parking can be operated. So on the simplification, uh, 26 sectors to six. On the on the left, you have existing. On the right, the proposed. That simplifies the code quite a bit. We had a core and non-core. That's the gray and non-gray. A further uh, level of complexity in the code. So we have a cleaner way to do it. Uh, we have six official types of parking that you could get approved for. We reduced them to four. Uh, basically combining commercial and residential and hotel into one growth parking, we call it. We're allowing sharing of parking. Uh, if you have parking today in a structure, or if you're going to have a new one in the future, we will allow you to sell it commercially to have somebody across the street or for events, schnitzer, you know, you know open up the, the, the gates. Uh, that would be allowed so long as it's in a structure. Uh, and again, this, I already talked about the simplification of the code and the, and the triggers for CCPR. Sorry, I think I'm uh, the, uh, repeating myself a little bit here. So that's the simplification side. Simplification side. On the parking ratio, you know, we had a long tradition here in the Central City having no minimum parking requirement. We uh, continue that, and we're post and we had maximum ratios on some uses, particularly office and residential, but not all of them. Now we're putting uh, ratios on all of the uses in the uh, in the zoning code. And we adjusted the ratios downward, downward in, in total, about 30%. You know, you could be able to build 30% less than if you were if you were forced to build to the maximum. Uh, under these new regulations, you build about 30% less. You know, um, and uh, we standardized some things. You know, residential and hotels pretty much get one ratio throughout the central city. That's what developers are building to anyway, about one per thousand uh, per unit. So. And that is our recommendation. You, know, you see the surface parking lot. This is a this is a view of uh, f like from Big Pink on towards PSU, and you see the moors and ramps. You know that's what we're trying to uh, rebuild, and we've done a pretty good job so far. About half of these lots have been redeveloped since uh, that we began to count in the 19 as part of the CCMP 95. About 2,000 of them have gone away. So on surface parking lot, basically we're limiting uh, no new surface parking lots. Uh, they will be prohibited with new development. Uh, today, you could build from 20 in the core, in the downtown area, in the closer area, and, and 60 in the outer areas. Uh, now we will be saying no new surface parking lot. The exception would be in the industrial zones, you know, the light and gray in the central east side, 
and Lower Albina were for industrial uses, you know, traditional industrial uses, warehousing, machinery, you know, you could be able to have some. If somebody would come in for rehab, rehabilitation of a structure, you know, that would not really trigger it. You know, you're just changing the, you know, the, 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 the use, not significantly changing the, the structure. We would allow you to keep the surface parking lot. So that is a recommendation now. Yes. Um, so could someone build a structured parking lot, not a surface, but a structured parking, just parking, no, no development above it? No, the answer is yes and no, actually. Uh, <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, sorry. I was trying not to come, uh, uh, talk about that so that we can move forward. Basically, uh, <laughs> but I can provide a 30-second uh, answer. Uh, parking, we, don't wanna, we didn't want to tear down buildings and build just parking. So you cannot build, it's called growth parking. So you, you can build parking with new development you know, uh, for long-term parking. There's one exception called visitor parking. That's how the smart park got built. You know, that's mm -hmm. you could uh, come to the city as part of CCPR, you know, do a study uh, of a demand study, and, and say, you know what, I went around three or four blocks, and uh, I counted spaces inside buildings and outside buildings, and I can tell you by via the study that uh, this park, this area is deficient, parking deficient for short-term use, not long-term use. You know, for retail use, for example. Yeah. And then you know we go through the paperwork and we allow you to do it, to build it. The trick is that you need to operate it as short term. So you cannot be selling it for commuters. So uh, only the city has uh, three visitor parking uh, um, structures have been built by the private sector. It's pretty expensive, and um, um, we have Smart Park to supplement that. You know, so it is possible, but it's not very common. It's called visitor parking. So. Uh, okay. So just to be clear, they'd have to. They couldn't renovate an existing building and put parking into it. Ah, and that's the second one. Yes, you can do that. They can. Yeah. So they could renovate a, 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 if it became vacant, they could create a parking structure inside of a building. Oh, um, good question. I don't Preservation. Yeah, but they're taking away growth. They're taking away the actual. It would be a remodel, I guess. So you have no longer office, but just Parking, just parking. What do you think of that? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm asking because someone's actually thinking yeah, about doing that in oh. yeah. where I work down yeah. on the central east side. The, the trick, you know, I'll go through preservation parking. They may help you. The, the issue is that the parking needs to be accounted for something. If it's if it's for another building, no, it's just it's a commercial parking lot for parking. That's what it would be. I, I don't need an answer yeah. today, but I'm just trying to. <laughs> yeah, it, it depends no, well, on what zone it's in. But hey, Mauricio, yeah. uh, this is a high-level discussion yeah. uh, today. Yeah. Okay. But there's all these categories, like what Mauricio was describing, of how you allocate that overall parking supply in the central city. But you're not getting into that level of detail today, or uh, no? But th it, generally speaking, we don't allow new parking unless it comes with new growth. You know, the, okay. the exception could be short-term visitor parking and preservation parking, which I'll explain right now. So okay. preservation parking. Is this uh, another category? We have an example. Basically, it's for parking for all buildings, historic buildings that d did not have parking to begin with, you know, or for park, uh, buildings that don't have enough parking. You know, they build very little. So basically, it's a mechanism for all buildings to remain economically competitive. So it assures parking for buildings without it. You know. So uh, it also encourages new development to not build to the top. You know, because you can always build more later if, to to meet your entitlement. So here's an example: an old building that doesn't have any parking, but it has entitlement. So we drew a little box, uh, orange box on top. You know. So that, that building uses the parking lot across the street to, for their customers and for their employees. Well, some, you know, a developer wants to redevelop that lot. That's the case of old town. You know, oh my god, I'm losing the parking. Uh, you can use, they can use that entitlement on top you know, to come to the developer and say, you know, can we build me another deck of parking for me? Used in my entitlement, so that orange box kind of moves, you know, to the new building and underground. I put it here in this example, but basically you can use that. Use it. It is as if it was, it was part of the building, but in reality, somebody else is building it for you. And if you have leftover, a second building could do it. You know, uh, until you you use your entitlement. So that's a way in which an old building that doesn't have as much uh, parking or doesn't have any parking could create more parking to serve their um, their needs. You know? So that's a way in which the code allows for um, 
new parking without getting growth. So that's so that there are two ways: this is the parking and preservation parking. We're maintaining this uh, mechanism. It's a lot more complicated than this, <laughs> so we're simplifying it, and also we're expanding this preservation uh, parking uh, tool to residential and, and uh, hotel uses as well. So uh, can I, can I ask? Quickly, yeah. Uh, what's a parking entitlement? It would be, you know, uh, each building, like this one, I guess. If you did, uh, it is, if it's entitled to one. Well, I don't want to get into the math. If it's entitled to a hundred spaces, mm -hmm. but it built none, it's still entitled to a hundred spaces. Okay. It basically is allowing developer B to build some, some of the one hundred. So for it's this building. A, ca a capacity that's attached to every. Building, yeah. and, if, but it, there's no money that goes with it or anything like that. Well, somebody's got to pay for the parking. So yeah, yeah. somebody yeah. would have to pay for the parking. Yeah, yes. but basically, just like FAR, you know, this building is sitting on a big, large box of FAR that is used or not used. You know, there could, there could still be some extra FAR that could be transferred uh, for parking. Some of that parking can be used in another site mm -hmm. in the future. So that's how it works. Real quick, yeah. just kind of get in the weeds, so we'll make it quick. So if, if parking ratio, let's say, is 0.7 per thousand, that's going up to one per thousand, does that new one per thousand get entitled to, for the transfer? Yeah. Got it. Um, so to summarize, that was the summary on the zoning. You know, it's actually in uh, the code, again, it's 100 pages, so this is a, quite a summary. But those are the big ideas. Um, on the public side, we want to continue to prioritize what's on the street for short stays for visitors in, um, to the central city. Prioritize the off street, the smart park, for again, for visitors, not commuters, and but also for longer stays. You know, if you're coming here for several hours, we'd rather have you park in the smart park, not on the street. And thirdly, we want to move to a new system of uh, managing parking called performance-based parking management. So what is that? It's the uh, new thing uh, that many cities are implementing, including in Seattle and San Francisco, the examples that I'll, I'll mention now. Our committee, Central City, com strongly recommended that we adopt this. So we're going to council in spring again to initiate this program um, citywide. You know. So uh, basically, we establish performance targets, you know, certain occupancy level, uh, and we coordinate the smart park and the on-street parking, and we adjust the rates based on so that we meet that parameter. Uh, here's an example from San Francisco. You know, San Francisco was able to do it per block. We won't be able to do it per block. The technology is you know, very expensive. They had a 20 million grant. But basically, uh, what it does is uh, maximizes customer experience. You know, it's a data-driven process, you know, not, not driven by revenue, and improves reliability. Basically, if, an area, if a block is very full, you raise the rates. You know. If, if an area is underused, then, uh, you know, nobody parks there, you, know, you lower the rates, and if you get, there, if you get about 85% occupancy, which is the industry, industry standard now, you, know, you don't need to act. And very clearly, uh, cities are doing this. You know, it's very clear, transparent. You know, you, there's like nice graphics that go there, and there's reporting that is on monitoring. So here's an example from Seattle. You know, they, they watch you, they, you know, they, they keep it within a, if, if uh, the, you do counts in occupancy and, and you're within a range, no action. If you're getting, you know, your parking is tight, getting tight, we put you in a watch list. If it's about a certain threshold, you know, we act. And so in the same, you know, if parking is not being as utilized, you know, eventually the, the, we lower the rate and everything gets published, you know, and uh, the rules are clear, you know, and we act on it. So that's the model that we want to move, move towards um, as, you know, as soon as council gives us the green light. So does that mean that you'll be able to set rates administratively without council action? That would be the hope, yeah. It may be that we work within a certain parameter, but uh, that is the, that's how it works. You know. um, yeah, so, uh, uh, and then most likely it'll be like Seattle, you know, we won't be doing it per block, but rather by area, you know, we would de develop parking areas like down, Old Town could be a logical place. Downtown, Pearl District, South Waterfront, they, you know, markets, parking markets, and then we would watch uh, their performance and adjust the rates so that we get about, we, went, we get to that performance target that we're talking about. Um, so that's uh, it from, for the central city. Uh, so next steps, we will come back to you in late May as part of the central city plan with the um, big document for your review. Uh, but We'll go to council sooner than that, we hope, uh, in spring 2016, to uh, ask council to initiate uh, uh, the program, the performance-based parking management. Okay? Thank you. And now I'll 
Uh, well, I guess if there are any Central City questions, uh, I guess. Are we going to just wait to the end and then ask them, or do you want to? Do you want to go through? So. Um, if it's Central City based. It, it, it is Central City. It's Central City. <laughs> it's Central East Side, but it's. Um, the concern I have, and, and you don't need to address it, is that in the Central East Side, there is enough demand that you can probably pencil a structured parking lot to build privately and fill it and make, a, make money, I, I think. And buy, that's just going in and green, buying a building, tearing it down, or remodeling it to a structure. If that's not our intent, we need to figure that out because I think that'll be the first place that you'll see them. But it seems to me if it's just a test of is there the ability to, f that there's too much parking and Central East Side meets that criteria because we've oversold the permit parking in that area, um, then they meet it by default almost that you would say yes. And if we're not intending to do that, we need to rethink how we couch our code because mm -hmm. there are people kind of circling the block in the central east side and looking at buildings and trying to figure out are you going to allow that or not? Yeah, uh, you can't. You could a private somebody from the private sector or the PDC. You know, they could go ahead and. Well, build. not PDC, but the private sector. Yeah, the private sector could. Can it, they can now build parking? Is, is that our intent? Park. Is but is that I'm, I'm asking? Is that our intent in the future that we want to have land taken up with structured parking? I'm, I, the difference is we have a and I'm. Comparing that to the, the position of, we say we want to limit surface parking, but we're okay with structure parking. I'm asking the balancing question. Uh, yeah, we allow we we allow it structure parking today. We will allow it in the future. Uh, we, there will be there are requirements. You know that it's in some cases be wrapped around ground floor. No, I activities. mean just standalone structure parking. You, we're limiting, I, I guess I'm confused of why we're limiting surface parking, but the person could come in and say in the same, on the same piece of property, yeah, put up 10 stories of structure parking, and that's okay, but I can't put, I can't take the lot and say it's a surface parking lot. Oh, okay, that's an urban form issue. You can get a lot more parking in a structure. You can build on top of a structure. You can put the structure on the ground. No, I, I mean, we're just, yeah. let's stick with the idea that it's just going to be structured. There's no residential or anything. It's just a parking lot. I, I'm, why, why one, not the other? And if it's, if you're saying, I guess I am hearing, just because it's 10 stories versus one, that's okay. Well, so think of it this way. <clears throat> the, uh, it's the more intense use of the land. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the um, expense of structured parking. So to yeah. get um, that more intense use, the more intense use is what we're interested in. Throwing down some asphalt and using it for parking is yeah. not, especially in a transit rich neighborhood like the Central East Side, especially in a place that's so close to employment centers, both in the Central East Side and across the river, right? Especially now we have a uh, streetcar and, and we've always had bus. So, but uh, the part of this that we didn't quite get into today, and that I will admit even I'm a little fuzzy on, so I'm looking forward to the Central City presentation, is that to build that commercial parking structure, um, the developer would have to get the rights to build parking from somewhere. And the rights to build parking, I'm looking at these guys to correct me, uh, uh, is this preservation parking idea, Andre? Yeah. So a building that existed before a certain date that did not have parking, <coughs> hypothetically has the right to so many to have so many develop uh, so many parking spaces, X number of parking spaces developed for its interest or use. Uh, the only other way you can get parking, stop me if I'm going wrong, is if you're building new development then you can get a certain amount of parking per square foot of new development you're building as well. Um, and then the 
third, a third type is visitor parking, but it's an anomaly. Let's, you know, that's that one that Mauricio described. So part of the way you think about it for a district is, okay, if there, the number of spaces you can build comes from the amount of development you have in the district. So if it gets all piled onto one spot or spread around to a whole bunch of buildings for a parking purpose, the way at least the logic of the system we have built, it doesn't really matter. Uh, the, the, um, e and even when you build a parking structure in the central city to the extent that you can really get it to pencil, you have to put in active ground floor uses and the like, and that's the kind of thing you don't get with the surface lot besides the um, number of years it's going to take to pay off, you know, it's tens of thousands of dollars of spa okay. a space. So, so that's, and then every space that exists mm -hmm. weakens the market for someone else to build parking. So, um, you know, if, if yeah. you wanted to build a parking supply in a place, having it in a structure and sort of one, u utilizing, you know, um, that amount of space for this one purpose is, you know, it'd be great to spread it around, but uh, you also really do crimp the economic motivation to build parking beyond that. And would the code require ground floor active uses in a structure like that? I believe it does. Mm -hmm. All right. And it, I'll just reflect that, you know, Everybody assumes it's a no-brainer that there's a market for a parking garage on Northwest 23rd, right? And Joe and I were part of an effort more than a decade ago to figure out where we might allow that and even make some extra allowances to allow that to happen. And yet the market has continued to choose to take all those opportunities and put retail buildings on them instead of parking. So it may not be the highest and best use, even if it's possible. Right. And, and you know, the, the part of this when we get into it that get, gets really confusing, too, is um, short term versus long term, how that plays to making a part of the central city like the central east side function like a park and ride, which would be suboptimal too, right? Uh, and so when we get into those rules or discussions, when Mauricio comes back with the central city plan, we'll, that those are the questions we need to, to explore. And just even the uh, last thing is on PDC's work, on examining use of the ODOT blocks, maybe for structure parking, even that gets is is not that easy to pencil. pencil. Although that changes, you know, um, with the market. When, so I don't know the conversations that went into it before, but I mean, just from a standpoint of air pollution, wouldn't it make more sense to have a single parking structure rather than? people idling around looking for parking spaces. So wouldn't there be an incentive for one large structure? Um, is the amount of parking not so much the surface versus structure? Uh, the, uh, but again, uh, looking for parking does add up quite a bit uh, to the circulation, you know, the car going around it. We haven't done the study here in Portland, but it could be 30% of the traffic in some, in some cities you know, are basically the same person going around looking for parking. So mm. performance-based parking management will help you that, you know, by actually if you you could have a space where you want to go, you know, you don't have to be circling around. So that, that has led in other cities, you know, in San Francisco, they've been able to demonstrate that has uh, improvements to transit reliability and safety, for example. So we want to replicate that here. And that's um, the don't they actually have an app or they have the ability? You have the ability to go yeah. online and you know that there's a space. And yeah, that's a technology that we'll have at this point, so but you know, going yeah. but at the same time, we want to begin to transition into a new program, you know, a better use technology, which has changed a lot and has opened up a lot of opportunities to monitor, to know what, what's out there and to react in a quicker manner. So and that's what we'll be working with council, uh, asking council very soon. Not to belabor it, but you're also talking different types of people. So typically the people parking on the surface lot, like you were saying, are maybe going to retail functions. They're not the people who are there all day, like Andre's talking about centrally side, who need a place to put their car while they're at work. And that's what those parking garages more often, unless it's visitor parking, get built is for the long-term parkers. But that's why we also, we want to limit the amount of parking so that you don't have that congestion that we want to encourage people to take transit, walk, and bike, you know, and carpool. Okay, thank you. I think this works, okay. Uh, so thank you, I'm, I'm Grant Moorhead. I'm a project manager at PBOT. I've been working on the centers and corridors parking policy update. Uh, and like Judith, this is my, my first official presentation to the commission. 
Um, uh, you may recognize my name from the riveting uh, street vacation staff report that you advanced in your consent agenda. So thank you for that. I write those. Um, I've been here many times. I usually sit in the back and don't say anything. So it's nice to be at the, at the table. So the Centers and Corridors project uh, really gets at, as Mauricio mentioned, the better on-street parking management uh, series of, of actions and goals that we've developed. We are responding in many ways to all the development, the successful development that's happened in our mixed-use areas over the last five, six, seven years or so since uh, the end of the recession, uh, and really trying to address that spillover issue that is uh, a function of the vibrancy that we're seeing in some of our mixed-use areas. Some of you were Many of you were on the commission when this, uh, these changes went through, but I know we have a couple of new members, so I wanted to just take a little bit of time to provide some background on what exactly happened in 2013 when PSC recommended and council ultimately adopted new zoning code requirements uh, for parking, minimum requ uh, parking requirements for certain multifamily developments. Uh, in your recommendation, you had a couple of other suggestions that um, I'll just walk through here. The, you asked that PBOT, work on developing a more holistic approach to parking management, and that we update our on-street parking permit system, and that whatever we come up with operate as a, you know, a piece of a larger transportation demand management or TDM program for these areas. Um, so I think you'll see that as we move forward over the next uh, 10 minutes or so, hopefully I can get through this pretty quickly, uh, that these three recommendations really are, are found throughout our, our, what, what we're proposing. So what is a holistic approach to parking management? Well, there's think of it as kind of like a three-legged stool. The first leg of the stool is the off-street parking supply, and there are two elements to that, how much parking has to be built, and that's what the zoning code amendments addressed by increasing the amount that would be required to be built. Uh, and then secondly, how is that managed? So who can use the parking? How is it operated? What kind of restrictions are in place? And BPS is working through their mixed-use zones project. Uh, I've been involved in that to um, develop some new zoning code language that they'll be bringing to you. I believe the first hearing is on uh, May 10th, and they are looking at removing some regulatory barriers to shared parking, similar to what we're doing in the central city, although with, with some, 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 some key differences. Uh, but the idea there being that using the, the existing parking more efficiently. So that's kind of the first leg of the stool. The other two that we've been focusing on, because this is more in PBOT's purview, is the on-street parking management side. So how do we determine who has the priority access to parking? And how do we integrate this into a transportation demand management strategy so that over the long term, we can reduce the demand for parking, reduce the need for vehicle ownership, and uh, help us to achieve our growth goals and our urban form, go form goals over the next 20 years? So this is the path the uh, policy path that we're looking at here, the centers and corridors parking. These are the on-street parking management policies and practices that will ultimately live in Title 16 of the city code. Uh, that's where our permit system lives. That's where kind of our meter district uh, policies live there and then and in our administrative rules. So I won't belabor the point here, uh, but you've seen this slide a couple of times. And we had a committee, a stakeholder committee that Chris served on. And we met 10 times throughout 2015, uh, beginning in late 2014 actually. And we looked at five study areas that were chosen uh, because they were seen as prototypical of other similar areas throughout the city that have similar characteristics in terms of their growth potential, in terms of their parking uh, markets, the dynamics of the parking systems there. And those five study areas were Southeast Division Street in the mid-30s, 28th Avenue between Burnside and about Sandy Boulevard, St. John's and Hollywood Town Centers, and then Mississippi Avenue between Fremont and Skidmore. So we looked at these areas Last spring, we did a very detailed examination of on-street and off-street parking dynamics. We looked at occupancy levels and turnover, so how long people are staying in a particular parking spot, so that we could have some data and really make data-driven decisions. Um, you know, you hear a lot about anecdotally parking is terrible. There's somebody parked in front of my house, but we wanted to be able to really say, how bad is it? What is the situation like out there? How are people using? the parking system and how should our policies reflect, uh, how can we better adapt to, to reflect the demand that we're seeing out there. So the largest work product, the main kind of uh, the meat of the work was this parking management toolkit that we developed with our committee. And this is really kind of a laundry list of about five dozen different strategies that we, PBOT, our parking operations group, will begin to employ uh, throughout the city it's a context sensitive, it's sensitive to land use, it's sensitive to the actual parking demand. 
um, to help us better manage parking. And it's really organized in a hierarchical way. So you start at the beginning with the very low hanging fruit, very easy things to do. We call that shelf one, it's user information. So just things like maps, websites, maybe an app, something like that. So people know about the parking situation. If you're going to a commercial district, where can I park? What if any restrictions are there? What if any costs are there? What alternatives are there? Those sorts of things, very easy, uh, not, not expensive, frankly, things that we can do. And then as you move up the, the shelf, up the shelves, uh, you get to the very last shelf, which is create new parking supply. So the idea here is that that would be the very last thing you would do. You would build that parking structure after you've managed your on-street parking system, after you've optimized the existing off-street parking system. Think of it as using your X-Acto knife from shelf one before you get the chainsaw out of shelf seven to continue the metaphor. Um, so this, I don't, I don't want to belabor the point here. I want to focus really on shelf five, which is implement and manage a parking permit program. This was in response to one of your recommendations and, and, and council did direct PBOT to uh, revise our parking permit program. This has gotten some, uh, there's been some press interest in this. This has been probably the most controversial element. This is something that our committee spent the most time on. So this is what I want to focus the remainder of my remarks on. Um, we have, a parking permit program in place already. We've had it for about 35 years. <clears throat> so a permit program allows someone who lives or works within one of these permit areas to buy a permit that then allows them to stay beyond the posted time limits. So if it's a two hour time limit, if I have a permit, I can stay longer than two hours. It's a pretty, pretty simple concept. And as Mauricio alluded to, and I think the map pretty clearly shows this issue, these are our 14 permit areas. And uh, basically what happens is people drive as far as they can without having to pay downtown parking rates. So we see these permit areas ringing the downtown area. Uh, so people will drive as far as they can and they'll get out and walk or bike or take transit uh, to their final destination. I think this may, be, it may have been more of an issue when we didn't have these permit areas and there was free bus service. Um, but it, nonetheless, these are, you know, we have 14 of them in place. Uh, they've been in place for about 35 years. Um, but it was designed specifically to address commuter parking. So if you look at our code, the criteria to establish one of these permit areas, the way that we look at the parking demand, they're designed for areas where the people are coming into the area early in the day and leaving around you know, midday to late afternoon. The demand is coming from outside and it's typically happening uh, in the midday. So our data analysis suggests that in our mixed use areas, in particular uh, Division 28 and uh, Mississippi were the three that really stood out. The demand is not occurring midday. It occurs late in the evening between about 7 and 8 p.m. And that's because you have the residents who live there home from work and you have these uh, restaurants, bars, music establishments, places like that that are, you know, drawing in a lot of people from all over the place. Some of these are, have even become almost regional draws. So there's that competition between people coming from outside and people coming uh, and people who live there currently, and there's also growth occurring within those areas themselves. As the development continues apace in our, in our mixed-use areas, the demand for the very limited and, frankly, not going to increase supply of on-street parking is only going to go up. So we need to um, start managing that as the, as the very valuable and limited asset that it is. So that's kind of where we've been, where we've been focusing our efforts. Now, when we looked at this, we found five key limitations to our existing permit program that we address with our proposal. And the first one is there's no explicit link between land use and parking management. So these permit areas tend to grow over time. And as they grow, they tend to expand into more over more disparate land uses. The Central East Side is a good example of this, uh, where it becomes more and more difficult to have a cohesive parking management strategy when you're dealing with mixed use, industrial, residential areas, all kind of under one umbrella. Uh, the second is we don't, the code doesn't allow limits uh, on the number of permits issued to residents. It does allow for limits on the number of permits issued to employers for their employees to use and for limits on the number of guest permits. But if I'm a resident of a permit area and I have 10 cars, I can get 10 permits. There's nothing in the code that allows any kind of limit to be set on that. And there is somebody in the Northwest who has five cars and gets five permits. I, I say 10 in, in jest, but that's actually not that far from, from reality. There's also, number three, we don't allow a limit on the total number of permits to be issued. So again, when this program was conceived, the idea was people were coming in from outside the area, but as areas have grown internally, the demand has gone up and up and up. And we find ourselves in a situation in several of our permit areas where the number of permits issued greatly exceeds, sometimes by over 100%, the actual supply of parking. So the permits have, uh, in some areas, have come to be derisively termed hunting licenses, 
where you have the right to look for parking, but you may or may not find it. So when that happens, when you get to a situation where you're issuing 8,000 permits for 4,000 parking spaces, they really, the permits themselves lose their efficacy as a parking management tool. So we want to be able to kind of, kind of dial that back and, and have it be more of a part of our performance-based uh, parking approach. Number four, the annual fee. Okay, I'm gonna go back on. Number four, the annual fee that we charge is currently $60 a year. That translates to $5 a month. And that's based on the cost uh, to PBOT to administer and enforce the program. That was seen by many of our committee members as a very low cost for uh, what is ultimately a very valuable piece of real estate of uh, the on-street parking system in a lot of our permit areas. So is there a way to more right-size that, uh, that, that, cost, that cost structure? And finally, uh, the existing program doesn't address equity. It was developed before equity was really embedded in our policies. So we want to address these five limitations. So if we can just bring back the, the three-legged stool, the two things that we're focusing on are managing on-street parking access and the transportation demand management link. Uh, complete, competing, completing the holistic approach to parking management without the need to further increase the mandatory requirements that would be in place for a mixed-use building such as the ones that you see on the screen here. These are both on Division Street. So to get to the, the bones, or the meat, I guess, of the proposal, the residential parking permit concept, uh, we want to address, as I mentioned, the five limitations that we identified in our existing program. So the first way that we do that is we tie the, parking prior, the priority parking access to the primary land use, and we do that by using the zoning code. So it's a residential parking permit program that would focus on areas that are zoned for residential use. And we would give priority access, although not exclusive access, and I'll get to that in a moment, but priority access uh, to permits would be for residents of the permit areas. Uh, we want to allow limits on the number of permits issued to residents, and we want to allow limits on the total number of permits that would be issued. The program is designed to be flexible. We're not going to say it will be this number, but we want to give uh, give neighborhoods the tools to be able to manage parking depending on what their needs are. There's going to be different uh, levels of demand, different mixes of residential versus employee versus short-term parking needs. So we want to be able to be nimble so that we can have a different, you know, different, um, different implementation strategies in different neighborhoods. Um, we want to have t TDM services, transportation demand management services in the form of education incentives and outreach included in the base permit fee so that everybody who purchases a permit in every neighborhood that ad adopts one of these will see some benefit. And they are, it is an opt-in program, so neighbors, neighborhoods will choose to uh, be in one of these permit areas. We won't be imposing them. And finally, we want to apply an equity lens to the implementation strategy. That's, so the equity lens, it's pretty broad. Can you actually I, I, I will. Oh, thank you. I will, thank you. Uh, so I'm actually going to skip that one and come back. So I mentioned the, <clears throat> the zoning basis for the permit system. So we're looking at applying them only to our zone properties, residential zone properties. But it's really a housing neutral proposal. Um, a lot of our, our zones have large apartment buildings, smaller apartment buildings. It's um, anybody who lives within those areas, regardless of whether they own or rent, regardless of whether they live in a house or an apartment building, would have equal access to permits. Residents and employees of the adjacent mixed use areas, we're not leaving them in the lurch. They would also have access to permits uh, up to the cap for each permit area. And so I'll just go back. And this is a very simplified schematic of a typical zoning pattern in our mixed use corridors uh, where you have the main street, you know, let's just say this is Division or Hawthorne, where you have bus service and storefront commercial zoning is very common. Uh, ground floor active uses, oftentimes there's residential above it, but this is the area where the parking is really intended to serve those retail uses. So we would have more active management of the parking in these areas. There would be two hour time limits, three hour time limits, whatever the case may be, loading zones, things like that would be focused on the main street so that we can support that, that uh, commercial use. People with permits would not be able to park here beyond the time limit. They would be subject to the same limitations as anybody else. Now in the surrounding residential areas where there's currently unrestricted parking, there would be time limits. So this is where the new two-hour accept by permit signs would go up, three-hour accept by permit signs would go up, and only people who have permits would be able to stay beyond the time limit. If you're a visitor to one of these areas, you probably wouldn't notice much of a change because we, we want to continue to support that retail. And, and one of the uh, 
results of not having significant off-street parking supplies in a lot of these areas is that the on-street parking supply carries a lot more of that burden. So we want to be able to continue to use the parking system to support short-term needs. Uh, the TDM service in, as a, in the base price of a permit, it's a little bit of a balancing act here. We want to make sure that I mentioned that these are, it's, gonna, it's an opt-in process. So we want to be able to charge an amount that ensures everybody sees a benefit in, in terms of, uh, you know, maybe it's, uh, maybe you get maps from, from our transportation options group. Maybe you get a discount on your bike share membership. It could be things like that. We're still kind of developing the specifics, but we don't want to set the price so high that people shy away from it and say, I'm not going to vote for that. So there's a little bit of a balancing act to be had there, but we want to have this, um, more holistically integrated into our overall transportation demand management strategy. And one of the ways that we do propose to do that is by having that base fee be set to include TDM services. But if you are buying a second or a third or a fourth permit, or in my case, 10 permits, you would pay more for each additional permit. I don't actually have 10 cars. Um, but that way, that's sending a market signal to people that if you do have four cars, maybe you don't need that fourth car that you only drive once a month. Maybe you should clean out your garage and use it. Uh, we want people to use the off-street parking that they have available to them rather than just storing their cars on the street uh, for long periods of time. So uh, one other provision related to that is that if you do have a, a parking spot on your property, we would start you at the second tier because we would count that as your first parking spot. Are you considering just one permit? That's a, that's a possibility. I hope. That's a possibility. So I, I mentioned that it's uh, they're, they're designed to be flexible. We have some provisions right now in Lair Hill, for example, just uh, Zone A, I believe it is, south of downtown. They restrict, they've, they've chosen to do this within their own permit area. They restrict the number of permits you get based on the off-street off -street parking supply. So if you have one car and a garage, you wouldn't be able to get a permit. So that's something that would be allowed. At, at this point, we're not proposing to require that, but that, that would be allowed under this, under this proposal. So for, say, in Northwest, where you have units with three, four unrelated individuals living in there, would it still apply the same way? First permit is cheaper, sec per second permit is more expensive. How would that, I'm just, I'm just trying to grapple with how that would work for unrelated households. Well, in Northwest, Northwest is a bit of its own animal. Um, this, uh, this, this proposal would apply to future permit areas. Existing permit areas like Zone M and Northwest um, I don't know if we're going to be able to get to the kind of, they're so oversubscribed right now, it's going to be very difficult for them to ramp down the number of permits they issue, for example. So I don't know if they will ever get to a point where they're playing by the exact rules that we're proposing for future permit areas. There may be some grandfathering that needs to happen for Northwest. Uh, we've had some conversations about that at PBOT. Um, but in general, if it's one address, so if it's me and my two roommates, yes, the answer is that the third permit, regardless of who gets it would, would cost more and maybe we share that cost equally among the household that's not you know something we're obviously going to know about but in, in general yes but if it's multiple units within right. a large home then each unit or address gets correct a it's based on the the code specifies by address so if you have a mailing address you are considered a separate unit so let me get that straight so if there's a house that has four mailboxes and four addresses like apartment A, B, even though they're 2173 A, B, C, and D, each one of those individuals could get multiple permits on a street. Potentially, yes. So the, the image on the top right of the screen is actually, a, and in, in the R5 zone, that's a, that's a duplex that duplex, has yeah. two, two separate addresses. So those would be considered separate units under this, under this concept. So equity, um, this question was asked. So we, we took some direction from the Portland plan and from the comprehensive plan policies on how do, we, how do we address equity. Equity is a very broad concept. So we focused in on the economic impact. We wanted to evaluate how this policy might disproportionately impact people with low incomes and mitigate any impacts. Again, there's a balancing act here because we don't want to create a system where driving suddenly becomes more attractive to people who do have options. So what we've settled on, at least for our recommendation, is that we would provide a discount on the permit cost to people who have a demonstrated financial hardship. That's something that they do in Seattle, and we think there are some lessons to be learned from that. 
Uh, we also want to identify any low income housing that might be impacted by a proposed permit area and identify what their parking needs are and if they uh, would be impacted in a negative way, we would elevate them to the priority that, that a resident of the permit area would have so, not, so as not to uh, potentially have a situation where people couldn't get permits if they needed them. We also want to provide a monthly payment option. And again, the idea that there's going to be enhanced TDM services in these neighborhoods, eventually leading, we're, we're hopeful, to small infrastructure projects, safety crossings, things like that. We're probably not going to be building any bridges, but increasing the safety and the walkability and livability of these neighborhoods, we think, is also an equity, an equity strategy. So that's my summary. Uh, the next steps on this are we're looking to go to council this spring on both the toolkit and the residential parking permit program. And I'm happy to take any questions. Oh, they're all lining up. <laughs> Eli, why don't you go first? Okay, two quickies. Um, one is, would you consider in parking districts waiving the off-street parking minimum? Um, the zoning now requires, obviously some of these districts are within 500 feet of transit, but they extend quite a bit further than that. Um, thinking that that's the chainsaw, right? If you're already doing the transportation demand, you might not need that. Um, creating more off-street parking. And the other question is, in those districts maybe charging for curb cuts um, where you're basically depleting the off-site, you're depleting the street parking supply. And there are definitely developments in the Mississippi corridor where there's curb cuts every 20 feet, um, basically removing um, street parking. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we do have a, to the second question, we, we would, in a sense, um, there, there would be, I don't wanna use the word penalty, but if you have a curb cut and you wanted a permit anyway, you would start at that second rate. Um, so there is there is a modest fee associated with that. I think if you're a developer and you build a curb cut, you basically, for perpetuity, get rid of a right. parking space on the street. That's sort of like removing a public good, right? I so, agree. So maybe I, I a developer agree. would have to pay for creating, or give them an incentive to we do. We do have a, you know, we have uh, permit review fees and plan inspection fees that are associated with driveways. Uh, I don't know exactly what they are off the top of my head in terms of the amount, the dollar amount. Um, but we don't charge SDCs or anything like that for uh, for the driveway itself. Um, we had we hadn't looked at at any anything specific to that. Chris. So let me start with the parts I like. Um, and the, the concerns that you will hear are all ones that I expressed during the stakeholder process. Um, I was not at the last meeting, so I didn't get to cast a dissenting vote. Um, so some very good stuff in here. Uh, I focus first on shared parking, which is a theme we're going to hear a lot in the next few months. We, we heard it in Central City. We're going to hear it in centers and corridors. We're going to hear it in Northwest at our next meeting where we're going to be asked to approve the zoning change. Um, using the resources we have more effectively by basically loosening the rules about who can park where, uh, very good thing. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad that this proposal will make use of that and we'll see that with the mixed use zoning project. We'll see the code for that, correct? Um, some really innovative ideas here in terms of you know, actually capping how many permits you issue, uh, the tiered pricing, uh, making TDM a basic component, uh, all great ideas. Um, Here's where I have concerns. Um, the first is that we're solving what I think is a transitional issue with a permanent answer. Um, you know, we have a situation now where our transit corridors are developing like crazy and we're seeing spillover into the residential neighborhoods and we're dealing with the reaction from the existing residents. Uh, and we're, we're designing a program to defend them but we're putting up a wall along the zoning boundary that will last forever. So, you know, I know lots of people along Division who have a single family house or live just off Division, and you know, they're legitimately annoyed that, you know, we have changed their life a lot with the new development. Um, but the next person who buys that house is going to know full well what they're getting into and it's probably buying it because of all those things that are now on division that they want to live next to. And baking in a privilege for them um, seems to me to be a mistake that we're, we're, you know, we're applying a long-term solution to a short-term problem. Uh, and I'd, I'd love it if we could devise a solution that was transitional in nature leading to something that we thought was long-term good policy as opposed to 
uh, baking a long-term solution to what I think is a, a short-term problem or a problem that will evolve over time. Um, my second concern is uh, we're treating, I think there, there are different issues for new development on the corridor versus development that's already occurred. So we know that on division, there were basically developers who externalized their parking demand on the neighborhood. And that sucks. Um, but there are now people living in those units. And this process would potentially remove supply from those people um, and leave them disadvantaged. Now I think, I feel very differently about creating a set of rules for the street and then the new developer coming in, putting up a building, knows what those rules are and builds the right amount of parking based on what he knows is happening on the street. I mean, that's the way, it, that's ideally in my mind the way it should work is you have clearly defined rules for the street and then the market responds with the off-street answer. Um, so for going forward point of view, great, but there are people who don't have parking in their building and are now gonna be in an environment where they are gonna be essentially at the mercy of uh, the single family neighborhoods around them about whether they get parking or not. And that leads to my third concern, which is uh, the governance aspect of equity, who has power. Uh, we're essentially saying the single family neighborhoods, and they, they are largely single family, there are some garden departments and whatnot, but the, you know, the residential zones immediately off the mixed use quarters are going to own the parking resource and set the rules and decide if and when they're going to allow the people in the corridors to use them. And that's a huge power imbalance. Uh, and I would, you know, I think we might all around this table guess that the, the economic and uh, ethnic composition of those residential neighborhoods to the side and the composition of the folks in the corridor look very different. Um, so we're creating a, a, a big issue with who has the power uh, and probably enforcing some traditional equity gaps that already exist and we're just making them stronger. So um, a lot here I like, but you know, I am not ready to recommend this until we deal with some of those issues. Just honored, you saw your hand up earlier. You yeah, I, I, no, um, I, I, first I wanna uh, follow up with what Chris said. Um, the issue of equity around density and parking, we have a policy to put our low income people on transit routes. And we, we enforce that even more in a new comp plan. Um, the equity issue is to me, the R5 controls that decision making power and we have the low income people in the non-decision making strategy as a city to say, we wanna put, we're, we're giving you incentives to put your housing as builders in on a corridor and then they have no power to control the parking. I, I'm, I'm a little concerned about how that plays out long term. Um, and I'm concerned about the neighborhood structures some people have been in neighborhood structures for years as a decision-making group. And even if the makeup of the neighborhood has changed, the decision-makers are still active. So how that is um, constructed. The other thing is I'm worried about the cost of the permit around equity. And the issue is for low-income individuals, I appreciate the idea that you want to lower the cost and try to figure that out. But if you're talking about higher costs, I'm worried, I'm, I'm, I would, I guess, openly ask the question, how high is that cost going to be relative to a bus pass? And can we take that person, that family that's in that low-income area and figure out a way to work with TriMet especially if they're around the corridor and get them a bus pass and subsidize the bus pass versus, and take a car off the street versus saying, yeah, you can have your car to park on the street. Maybe a bus pass is a better option for them. It, it certainly is relative to their economic situation in terms of paying for gas versus a bus. And if we can look at that kind of option because if you're at $60, you're starting to get 
pretty close. You're not a bus pass, a monthly bus pass, but that's a pretty good subsidy if you're going up and you're going to subsidize it in some way to work with TriMet and see what could come up on situations like that. Sorry, it looks like the light's on. Uh, in the conversations with our, our staff that work in our TDM program, um, they have said to me that the, the idea of the subsidized bus pass, that's sort of the, the holy grail of TDM services. If you're getting half off your bus pass or if you work for you know, a large employer that I, I worked for the port when I was in grad school, I had an annual bus pass for $25. It was a tremendous benefit. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, there could be a way to structure our TDM program so that low-income folks do have priority access to that level of TDM service. Uh, in order to be able to afford that, though, we, we would need to have a fairly robust uh, revenue stream because that is the most expensive of all the TDM measures that, that are, are potentially out there. So that's something we can explore. And I would say explore it sooner than later because I'm on a TriMet committee that's looking and exploring that holy grail. Uh, the board has opened that Pandora's box and so I think that opportunity to talk to them about doing that. Um, lastly, it seems um, the commercial side, um, this is not an equity issue, but just the commercial side of how does, I'm concerned about the commercial side kind of being left out of the whole process. <laughs> um, you have the residential and everybody, but we need to kind of keep the commercial side. The vision is great because we have the commercial businesses there. We have all the restaurants and everything. Um, that's what people like. Um, they don't like the parking, but the parking is temporary. It goes away at 2 o'clock or 12 o'clock or whatever. Um, so somehow that parking needs to be preserved for, that, for the new districts to be viable. And, and, and I think we need to be able to tell developers that there will be parking there for the businesses for it to be viable long term. Yep, Teresa. So different tact on the topic. Do you have either provisions, requirements, or incentives for car sharing spaces? So not shared parking, but car share, flex car, that kind of stuff. Not specific to this proposal. We we do have um, within Peabot a, a you can get a reserve spot for for car share. On street, uh, there's a there's a, I believe a fee associated with that, um, but that's not something that we incorporated into this. I'm not sure I, I agree with that answer. Um, you know, we we allow parking buy down when we require parking through provision of car share spaces, and you know, I, from what I've read of the TSP TDM language, car share is an important component of citywide TDM programs. So I would expect to see car share showing up in a robust way in these corridors. Yeah, from the zoning code perspective, there, there is a provision to decrease the required amount of parking. That's something that the PSC recommended back in 2013. Other questions? Maggie? Yeah, just a quick comment. I'd like to, to jump off what you both said. Um, I'd love to see how we can leverage this uh, for a low-income fare, TriMet fare, right? If we're if we're able to put in um, incentives and subsidies through PBOT through the city, in addition to TriMet and Metro for low-income fare, I think. I mean, this is an opportunity. I would think to be creative and and try to leverage that. So I just have a um, couple of comments, questions. Uh, first comment is. I support all of your concerns, Chris, and I actually support everything he said in, that was supportive as well. So um, in general, I um, have the exact same concerns. Um, one easy question. So um, for a single family residential home who's got their own curb cut in their garage, but yet their, their driveway could support three cars, do they still get to buy an off-street stall? And I guess what I'm wondering is, like, you know, is there something, if you're going to buy the, go back to Eli's point, if you're going to buy the curb cut, maybe it's more than you've got to pay the price for the third permit or something like that because you've got the garage and the driveway and the curb cut if you have that garage setback. Something to think about, if you haven't already. 
you don't have to comment. Um, and then last but, not, last but not least, I see it's getting late, Thank so you. I'll just let us go. Um, for uh, along the corridors, if there's an affordable housing project being built there, um, and now that we're going to be looking at minimum parking standards, it's so expensive to, to build that parking that it seems there might be also another kind of way to look at give the affordable housing a break on the minimum parking requirements and give them the permits on the street as a kind of boost to your what you're doing as an incentive to, to lower income households. Um, and um, it'd be, if, if I remember right, when we were kind of talking about this previously, is, is there a point where those in the corridors for a certain period of time can maybe buy a residential permit in the, or not ever? Yes, they can. Um, our, our analysis showed that right now in our, in our study areas, if we were to implement one of these permit areas, uh, everybody who lives there now, including in the mixed use areas, would be able to get a permit. We wouldn't be shutting anybody out. Um, but in the current proposed governance model, it's up to the folks who live in the residential zoning to decide whether to grant that privilege or not. Well, that's, that's not exactly true. The, the, the decision-making authority ultimately rests with PBOT and with staff. Um, so really, it's a performance-based parking question. We wouldn't support a neighborhood saying, here's our permit program. We're going to cap permits at 30% of supply. We, we would not go along with that. It would need to be something that's related to the actual supply. And again, it's a performance-based question that is going to depend on the mix of parking needs. So you know, I, I wouldn't be too concerned that our city traffic engineer or the PBOT director would go along with a type of proposal that's just inherently inequitable like that. I, I, I wouldn't be too concerned with Maybe that. Maybe I missed, I thought it was just our zones, residential zones. Did I miss something? Our zones is where the permit area would be, that's where the boundary would be, so the permits okay. would only be valid in the R zones, and the priority access would be to people in the R zones. But so if you live in a commercial mixed use four story building in a CM zone, or Right. I was trying to figure out in that situation, could you buy a permit or not? You could at the you could up to the cap. So what I what I stated earlier was that our current parking levels and our current development levels, we wouldn't be reaching that cap. We don't believe in any of our permit areas. Now five years from now, we may be at a situation where a new development comes in and they are, they are not able the residents of that building are not able to acquire permits because we've established a waiting list or or however we address that once the cap is reached. But at this point in time, I think we're far enough ahead of this that we wouldn't be at that situation. So, so the the last little piece I was going to tag on that is the cost of the permit versus, and you probably have already studied this, but the cost of what, for, so for a, a mixed use family in the corridor, or mixed use project in the corridor that's providing parking right now, what are they charging to lease that stall versus what's the cost of that permit? And if that gap's still that big, nobody's going to want to lease that stall. You're going to disincentivize still, and Maurizio, you're the one that kind of made me start thinking about this. You know, it's like, how do you still incentivize those in the mix in the corridors to build parking with, unless and, and if there's a gap in that pricing gap, you're still going to kind of have that swing happening. Right. We we found through our analysis that a lot of the buildings that do have parking, and you know, in the aggregate, if you look at all the mixed use buildings that have been built over the last five years or so, it's been about uh, 0.5 stalls per unit. So you know there have been some with no parking. There have been some with quite a bit. The average is about about one per two one per two units. Um, it's not uncommon for that parking to be underutilized, uh, significantly underutilized in some cases, and that's largely due to the fact that they're charging what they believe is a fair rate that can be up to $100 a month. The average I think was 103 in the in the five or six buildings we looked at. Uh, on, on street parking is free, not as plentiful. It's going to be more difficult to find, especially if the neighborhood is is you know bustling like Boise or or uh, Richmond, but you know, people will drive for 20 minutes rather than spend a dollar to, to, on a parking spot. That's just a, that's a human psychology thing that we, we're not going to be able to address probably directly through our policies as much as I'd like to. Um, so I think the average is maybe, to get to your question, maybe about $100 a month. And I don't think we're going to be able to have a permit system that costs that much at this point. Um, again, there's that the balancing act between providing people with a tangible benefit and providing a program that they don't see as overly punitive that they would be willing to to enter into. So we're trying to trying to thread that needle. And yeah, so that's why um, one thing to say that's why at this point the priority is for the residential. So that at some point you know if you cannot find parking, you will end up using the parking that your building had to begin with. Secondly, if buildings remember this is one tool on the shelf. We have about 60 others. So shared parking, for example. 
you know, you, uh, people will be able to make arrangements to find parking across the street in the bank and so forth. So the, there are other tools, most of them to help and uh, protect those commercial corridors you know, and allow them to grow smartly. So this is just one idea. So and thirdly, uh, we're not done with the program, so we have very good questions. You know, we have the questions ourselves, but also this, we want to be able to provide some direction, but also some flexibility so that each area can tailor uh, their program to their specific needs. So it's finding that balance. You know, we're working ourselves on it. We don't have quite a proposal before council, but these questions are very good, and you know, we're working towards them. So. so one suggestion I would make is that you should really think about structuring your governance model for the districts so that even if the permit zone is in the, the residential zone, the mixed use residents and the businesses there have representation in the process of deciding what the rules are. Yeah, we do have a, the current proposal would have the neighborhood association and the business association both be at the table well, as, as a requirement. Neighborhood association is different than specifically the residents of the mixed use yeah. zone. We, we got the comment, you know. Right. Okay. Um, so, you know, we're not voting on this because the narrow piece we have approval over for is the mixed, the shared parking will come to us in a little bit, but uh, I'm going to suggest that we write a letter to Director Treat and Commissioner Novick expressing our concerns and asking that PBOT come back to us uh, with some responses to those. Does this come to us? I mean, oh. no, only the shared parking component comes to us. This is PBOT. This is PBOT's Title 16. The, the Senators and Corridors project Correct. comes to us, though, right? The Mixed Use Zones project, which is the, the zoning element of the mixed which use will areas. Carry the shared parking zoning, yeah. but the permit system itself is Title 16, and we don't have formal authority. It's different in the Central City since the Central City parking. Mm -hmm. uh, there's so much of the regulation that's in Title 33, not all of it, though. Um, and there's much less of that in the neighborhood. I'd second that proposal. I'd second the proposal that we get a letter so staff doesn't just come back with what's proposed so far. So it, perhaps we can put that on the agenda for the retreat? We could put it on the, the agenda for the retreat, and uh, we should, that's a good solution. This may be a subcommittee kind of letter. They bring it back, and we have uh, next Monday to talk about it. Okay, great. Any other comments or questions? If not, we're adjourned. Thank you, Maurizio. Thank and you. Grant. Thank you.